Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another Second Breakfast podcast. I'm Andy Roth, alongside Phil Duvall. Say hi, Phil. Hey! Hey! And it's the end of another long week, which means Oof. Friday, which means... Mail back. Ah, a power I didn't, know, I didn't even know I had. Um, that's so right. much power. Like I'm, like I'm like you. Just pull the strings, man, and I'll dance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dance, puppet. So, <clears throat> it is time, as Phil said, it's time for another viewer mailbag where you send in the questions to Second Breakfast Podcast at Gmail com. And we answer them on the air. And that's pretty much, I mean, it's a mailbag. You've seen this before. That's on, on the, the whole, internet. that's right. it. We're you not, said it really well. Right. We're not breaking new ground here, folks. Okay. But we do have some excellent questions today. Excellent questions. Let's get to it. Yes. Question number oh. Uh. <laughs> from, from a friend of the podcast, Damon. Hello, Damon. Hello, Damon. I need to remember to email him because he isn't on Facebook, and so he will never know that we have used his question. <clears throat> I'm so wait. What? I know. I know. I know. Yeah, does on. he listen to? Does he watch us on YouTube or does he listen to us on iTunes? To be perfectly honest, I'm not sure. Damon, I, I, let us know how you experience Second Breakfast Podcast, please. And I would like more people to know that, that we are on iTunes and yes. you can download our podcast because a lot of people that I'm friends with who enjoy our show on a casual, a cash level yes. say uh, it's a really long time to be watching a video, which I completely agree. I don't know why anyone would watch this. I do, however, think – no, no, I mean I think we're great, but I do, hmm. however, think – that uh, this is like really like you you if you had iTunes and you download podcasts you listen to this in your car or while you're jogging or at the gym or um, try, pretending you're listening to a loved one I think this is perfect <laughs> think about it if you were listening to this instead of listening to a loved one they'd be talking and you'd be pleasantly laughing and being yeah. like yes oh oh and they'd be like eh, first depending, time ever this person understands me depending on the conversation you're having. Right? I'm just trying to save marriages, Andy. That's all I'm I trying to do. I appreciate that. Hey, your and your your valiant efforts have not gone unnoticed. One day at a time. <clears throat> Damon's question. Addressed to you, but I'm hijacking it. I'm going to answer it too. Phil. Yes. When pressed for good movies and TV shows, your most frequent answers seem to be The Godfather, Goodfellas, and The Sopranos, which taken together constitute a bit of a theme. I don't... What, what I don't think what's the, talking I don't about? Mm. Oh, do you think that the gangster genre has some inherent quality that makes its members of a higher average quality, i.e., the genre is inherently good? Mm. Is there disproportionate representation in your list of favorites a statistical coincidence? He's a he's a he's a he's a, he's a brain scientist, by the way. Okay. Okay. I.e., the genre. That's why this question's giving me a headache. <laughs> I.e., the genre isn't inherently good, but these works happen to be objectively so. Or do you just personally like them? I.e., they're not actually better than the best movies in most genres. It's just a subjective preference. That's a fantastic question, actually. And I think other people have written much more extensively and articulately than I could possibly uh, expound upon right now in terms of the, the potential depth of the mob, of the mob genre. And I don't, I honestly don't know why, because outside of those particular things you name, well, first of all, you also didn't name my, my whatever press for movies, I always talk about Pulp Fiction, which is kind of set in a gangster it's zone, not, it's but not, a, completely it's not the mafia. Right. Whereas, whereas Godfather, Sopranos, and Goodfellas are all dealing with Cosa Nostra in a very specific way. Yes. And, and, um... I, I don't have a huge list of mob things that I love besides those things. And what attracted me to The Sopranos was not, in fact, that it had a mafia thing going for it. I mean, first of all, it is generally accepted by film people that, the, that Goodfellas is the greatest movie of the 90s. Like, it's generally accepted or it's put out there by a lot of people. That it's the best movie of the decade or at least way in the conversation. Right. It's generally accepted by film critics and people that Pulp Fiction was a defining movie of, the, of, of our generation, whether it's great or not. And I saw it when I was 14. I don't really think I have to say anything about The Godfather. You do not. And, and, You're um, welcome to, but you do not. 
And I have maintained, and I completely and utterly have borrowed this idea from other writers when The Sopranos came out, that The Sopranos is the sort of godfather, so to speak. Not godfather in the sense of like, oh, godfather, but literally like the, like the sort of the, the, the beginning, I should say, like the genesis of this, this, this television renaissance, this television sort of golden age. That 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 this, there are other things that might have might have predated it, but The Sopranos was the thing that really crystallized it. Uh, the, there was a writer for GQ, and uh, I believe it was GQ when the when the show first came out. It had only been one season in or two seasons in. Who wrote that it was the greatest piece of either literature, or American literature, or pop culture, or something like that in 25 years? I mean, it, there are people out there who were making that argument already. Sure. And I and, and I would stand by it. So I think I'm actually really sort of just uncreative and boring based on the things that I like because I like the things that are everybody likes. Um, that being said, we all know I'm a Bible guy, um, uh, uh, and and I love deep symbolism and mythology. And I got to tell you, the mafia the mafia genre allows for amazing questions about. Um, You know, um, what's that word? Um, um, loyalty, mm -hmm. honesty, um, breaking the rules, and yet being someone like like being a um, 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 an, an antihero, which Americans love. It's it's a it's a wonderful American mythology, mm -hmm. um, especially immigrant culture, tribalism, violence, power. Um, like I said, anti-hero loyalty and, and and forsaking of loyalty. Um, these were a lot of things that Americans and money, the love of money, and the and the and the desire and ability to do quote unquote whatever you want. These are all major themes within the within the mafia genre. Yep. And so I think that the mafia genre has the potential to really delve on a symbolic and mythological level into our American psyches in a way that is like. I think paralleled only by paralleled only by Western movies. Interesting. Um, um, I these <clears throat> more accessible than Western movies because they're set in urban settings and most of us don't live in rural areas anymore. So I think it's even more more accessible in that sense. I think I I, mean, I certainly don't really have anything new to add or not not completely different to add. But but I, I'm really glad that you said what you just said because. Because what I think, if it is true that there is something special about the mafia genre, and I'm not, I'm not necessarily willing to concede that. I don't think a genre, there's anything necessarily special about any genre. Um, but if there is something special about the the mafia or gangster genre, it is that it it is instantly recognizable as itself, right? Yeah. It, I knew exactly what you meant when you said Pulp Fiction is a gangster movie without it being a mafia movie, right? Um, it's instantly recognizable as itself, but within that, it is completely malleable, and it can be anything, it can, and it can symbolize anything. So in a mafia movie or in a gangster movie, you can have, as you say, uh, uh, issues of loyalty. And I'm just, uh, let's just talk from a, from a dramatic and other genre standpoint. You can have comedy. You can have drama, you can have action, you can have romance. There's like, we see all of these things. And when you tie it up in a bow, and I, I love that you said this, when you tie it up in a bow of that sort of, we're getting away with something because we're rooting for someone we shouldn't be rooting for. Yes. I think I think that's a very, Frank, I just, I, if I can use the word, I think that's a very seductive uh, structure for, a, for, for any movie. And yeah. when that's the, when that's the, when those are the tropes of the genre, I think yeah. that I think that it strikes a chord more yeah. often than not in most people. It gives us a chance. Antiheroes are really interesting in mafia, especially because it gives us a chance to again to root for the person who is not squeaky clean, which mm -hmm. all of us or many of us like on some level. And at the same time, what is the thing that we love about them? That they are men of respect, so to speak. Yes. Yes. So yes. there's this mental I mean that whole like that's why Goodfellas, one of the many reasons why Goodfellas is a perfect film. It sets it up as where do we how are we introduced to the mafia? Through a child's eyes. Literally. Through a child's yes. eyes. And he understands it first and foremost as fun, power, and then respect. Remember, um, one day, 
One day, some kids from my school carried my mom's groceries all the way home. You know why they did it? It was out of respect. Yeah. Like that, and that is that first. <clears throat> four, that first. I mean, I just got goosebumps. That first four yeah. minutes, like, sets up the ent- the rest of the movie. They're degenerates and awful, but because of the way it's it it, it introduces you, um, you're able to see this idea that it's about respect and freedom and joy. And then the rest of the movie is. Th- um, the exposition of that, which ends up being a dismantling of that. Yes. At, as for The Sopranos, I love television. There has never been a show like it, um, for better or for worse. Right. Even the things that people don't like about it, there has never been anything like it. And for that. me personally, there is no, there is no single character in the history of television that I have been more enraptured by than Tony Soprano. And the second would be Carmela Soprano. Those are my two favorite television actors of all time. Um, oh, and by the way, let's not forget the fact that there's almost always some religious aspect to this stuff. Yeah. And so I'm always intrigued about how that's played out. <laughs> right. So anyways, uh, it's, I mean, the, the, the most, the first, the, what's considered the first great Sopranos episode is the episode called College, where Tony goes to take his daughter off to visit Bowdoin and some other colleges in Maine. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, back at the farm, Carmela <laughs> basically spends the night with Father Phil. That's his name, yeah. which is weird for me, but right. Father Phil uh, in Tintola. And uh, uh, there's a very weird, just like that whole her desire for redemption, but there's that weird romantic relationship and power struggle that is not really cons- consummated, but like all that stuff that it, it's, it's all, it's everything, man. I think it has a great potential. That being said, Sopranos, Goodfellas, Godfather, there's like, I mean, Miller's Crossing, uh, the, the Coen Brothers yes. movie, uh, I love. Outside of that, I don't, I mean, I've, I've watched a lot of mob movies. I mean, I'm not, I don't really like analyze this or that. Um, Donnie Brasco. You know, some movies. Donnie Brasco's really good. Donnie yeah. Brasco's really good, actually. It's hard to watch more than once, but it's really good. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great genre. I do. I think it's a great. I think it has. I think it's got great potential. But I just, for whatever reason, I mean, I think you're looking at some of the real high points of the form are are being used in that genre, and I'm I'm not all everything I just said still doesn't make me convinced of that. I completely understand why that is, which is funny, but. Perhaps, is this something that might play into it? You know, <clears throat> we think of Coppola as the guy who directed The Godfather, right? But he directed other amazing movies, right? He's yep. not a gangster genre director. We think of Scorsese as the guy who directed Goodfellas, but, I mean, certainly Scorsese has done amazing movies in multiple genres, right? Yes. So, yes. unlike, say, horror, the gangster genre has something that not only attracts viewers in the audience, but it attracts sort of the brightest minds of filmmaking, perhaps. And, and, and I mean, I don't know what the reputation of the people who wrote and directed episodes of The Sopranos were, what their reputations were before they did that. But perhaps, perhaps. Well, but you course, can, Quentin Tarantino. but you can see, you can see after the fact. You see the people who've come out of the writing right, studio of David right. Chase. <clears throat> I mean, the guys who created Mad Men and uh, yes. and um, there's. I'm trying to remember. There's a whole like basically a ton of the shows that are, everybody thinks are great right now were all created by people who came through the the right. the, the Sopranos right. mill. But also, but also, if you got as you said, I thank you for remembering it. Miller's Crossing from the Cohen, but like like, you can name a bunch of amazing directors who have not made a romantic comedy or a horror film but many of the true brightest lights yeah. have made a gangster film does that make sense does Sergio make sense? Leone yes once yes. upon a time in America yes mm-hmm. I, I'm anyways so I think it's I think it's a ripe genre and I think you've made a really good point and 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 I'm gonna just I'll go the inverse of that which is wouldn't it be amazing to see a Scorsese um, a Scorsese or a Coen Brothers deal deal in earnest with the zombie genre. I would love that. I mean, I seriously, that. though. I, I, I tell them what you told me about the World War Z uh, unabridged. Uh... Oh, because this gives me hope. Know. This gives me hope. This gives me hope. The audience may know of my love for not only the zombie genre, but but the book World War Z. 
And a few years ago, it came out in 2007, 2008, somewhere around there. Uh, early, earlier than that. Did it? Okay. Like 2005, okay. 2006, but yeah. Okay, okay. But at some point after that, they released an audiobook, and it had great actors in it. I mean, uh, I think F. Murray Abraham was in it, Mark Hamill was in it. Uh, and, and because it's an oral history, it's a, you, you had the opportunity to cast just a bunch of people. But it was abridged. And so, frankly, I got to the end of the audiobook and I was like, eh. Eh. But because the, genre, the zombie genre has stuck around and because the love for World War Z has stuck around, they are releasing, I believe, May 14th, 2013. Mark your calendars, kids. The unabridged, they have, they have gone back and they have filled in all the gaps. And one of the gaps, there is a guy who, if there is a villain in the book, it is this guy who makes billions of dollars marketing a fake cure for zombieism, right? Yeah. And he's just a total sleazeball. He's just, oh, it's, it's just a great, the worst. It's a great satire on <clears throat> all the bad things about uh, the the uh, medicine industry, yes. the narcotics industry. Yeah. Um, and he will be vo- he was left out of the abridged version, and he will be voiced. Wait for it. Go ahead. By Martin Scorsese. How cool is that, people? So cool. So cool. Because, <clears throat> I mean, not only is he one of the greatest directors ever, not only is he, as you have said multiple times on this podcast, the single most important voice for film preservation and film history out there, yeah. he also yeah. just has an awesome voice. He has, voice I, love, I love his, his voice. voice. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Yeah. All right. Shall we move on? Yes. Great okay. question, Damon. Uh, I, I think we answered it maybe. <laughs> right, we 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 did not definitively not answer your question. We definitely talked until you wished that we would change the subject. So moving right so, along, so, so we shall. Next question from friend of the podcast, Allison. Hello, Allison. Allison, two weeks in a row in the mailbag, sister. Good job. Boom, knocking it out. Name your go-to movie for a massive, massive sob fest. I'm sorry for a what, Andy? A massive sob fest. <laughs> massive. You're already crying. Your nose is That's stuffed. That's true. Um, you go first on this one. Um, okay. Well, this is this is a little complex because you know, at the risk of being sexist, what what popped into my head when she asked this question was, frankly, like Bridget Jones eating a pint of ice cream and watching a movie that she knows is going to make her cry, and I don't know that I've ever done that. Right. No, but, I think I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to give you permission for the next five minutes and five minutes alone yeah. to be totally sexist. And, and then we'll go back to being good people. But okay. I think this question has a sex I think this question has a sexist answer for most men. Most men are not going to cry at, at what most women cry at. Sure. Sure. Uh, and, 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 and not only that, I think it's also a function of I cry at movies all the time. I just yeah. do. And I don't yeah. mind it. I almost I, cried I, last I night at the end. I almost cried last night at the end of Almost Famous. Awesome, love it. Which but made no I, sense. But I don't, and it is cathartic to cry because it's a release of emotion, right? It is cathartic to cry, but I don't necessarily think that I'm looking for the same thing when it, as as what she's talking about. So, what I will usually do is, if I'm like, oh, I'm feeling a lot of emotions, I will put in a movie that makes me feel something, anything, and. If I feel anything strongly, whether it's sad or uh, terror or uh, I'm laughing, if I feel a lot of things at the beginning of the movie, by the end, if there's any sort of emotional cue, I'm a I'm a wreck, right? Um, and I don't think that's unusual. Uh, I just think I, I I but I'm an easy mark. Um, right. So so I put together a list of scenes and of movies that do this for me. And I would love your take on them. I'm ready. Scenes. I mean, first up. It gotta be the swamps of sadness from the never ending story. I mean that that scene Stop. Right? Why would they even that's still <laughs> like I can't even cry I, it's like I just get up and walk out of the room. It's what are you doing? <laughs> Come on. We're kids and we're crying. It's and also you know like it's also like Atreus is supposed to be this great warrior. Get your horse out of the mud, you idiot. Like it's right? not like right? Yes. I'm still mad at him for that yeah. 25 years later, I guess is what I'm saying. Indeed. Indeed. Um, the End of Big Fish, a Tim Burton movie that I think has been unfairly forgotten. 
Um, the end of Ikiru, the Kurosawa movie, I will not shut up about. I don't. I'm not even. I'm not even human at the end of that. I'm crying so hard. Uh, the end, and this this is actually sort of the geekiest answer potentially. But the end of Billy Elliot. Have you seen Billy Elliot? Yeah, sure. sure. Where he's where he's where he's the adult and he's dancing, and you just see his back, right? Like. Yeah. But it's such a glorious, like, artistic moment that it just get it gets me every time. It gets me every time. And and seeing the dad there, and oh my, oh, I'm a mess, a mess. Um, the end of Synecdoche, New York. I haven't Have seen, seen it. Yet? I had it on my DVR for like two years because mm -hmm. Jeremy Goldstein told me to watch it, and I had it on my DVR for two years, and then my DVR got wiped out completely, and I lost a bunch of stuff that was on. That is a huge loss. Huge. Well, I mean, um, it's not that huge. I'll find it again. Indeed. Uh, movies, very quickly. Iron Giant. I'm a mess at the end of that movie. Uh, Pan's Labyrinth. Warrior. Which is about mixed martial arts, and I get that, but it's actually about family, and the acting is superlative. Um, and my final answer, I've saved because it is the most ridiculous, and I freely admit that. And it's a movie I've talked about at length on this podcast before. Hoop Dreams. Yes, it's a three-hour documentary about inner-city kids playing basketball. But because you watch these kids grow up throughout high school, you're so invested in them, the last hour of this movie, because you're not just invested in them, you're invested in their families. Sure. And seeing, to some extent, what is happening or what happened to them at, during that time period yeah. for happy reasons, for sad reasons, I'm, I, I am a mess during the yep. last part of that, of that movie. Yep. yep. That's it. So, so while you were, geez, okay, well, oh, that's it. That's all. That's all you yeah, got. Yeah, that's me? it. That's okay. it. Sorry. So you know. while you were talking about that, I thought about the end of Searching for Bobby Fisher, and I almost started crying just thinking about it. <laughs> when he goes to his dad, Joe Montaigne, and he's like, "I offered him a draw," and he's like, "I know, son," and like I'm like, "Oh, okay." Uh, yes. 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 I want to answer first up before instead of just doing scenes where we're gonna cry, although I think. Uh, that is your list was amazing. I want to try to answer from my perspective Allison's question as as directly as possible. Movies that I go to for a sob fest. Now Andy's point is really well taken, and I agree. We don't go to movies for the sake of crying, right? And I think you're right that there is this mentality that like, um, oh, if I'm feeling emotional, I need to watch something that'll make me cry. Yep. Men will, by and large, at least old school men, which Andy and I are sort of right on that borderline. Um, uh, will not do. Yeah. Um, if I'm really sad personally, by the way, it's music. I will go listen to um, yeah. certain certain albums and certain uh, Frank Sinatra's "We Small Hours." Um, when I was in Italy, uh, when I was in Italy uh, in college, I was pining for someone, and for literally two months straight, I only listened to Frank Sinatra's "We Small Hours" and Bob Dylan's "Time Out of Mind." They were, I would get sick of them and go and put something else on and about halfway through the song be like never mind awesome awesome Love i was it. literally walking around like snoopy like doo -doo -doo, doo -doo -doo -doo. <laughs> so anyways um okay but there are movies that i know allison when i put them on i will cry okay yes. and not just like get a little teary-eyed i'm gonna cry okay <laughs> First and foremost, and by the way, this should remind you of the Sleepless in Seattle scene where the women are crying about love affair and you're like, they're like, the men are like, whatever. Yeah. And then the men are in Affair to Remember or whatever the movie it was, Love Story. And then the men start talking about, is it is it Dirty Dozen or Magnificent Seven? It's like it's one of those It's Dirty Dozen. Movies. It's Dirty Dozen. And then the men start to cry talking about yes. the hair. That's sort of how this is going to be right now. Indeed. Um, um, Lord, of the King, Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. Um, okay. I will cry so much during that movie. Oh my god. It's not just once, it's several times. It's um, several times. Okay, but well, first of all, go back to Lord of the, King, Lord of the Rings, um, Two Towers. Mm -hmm. And when Gandalf the White comes over the hill on the third day and screams as he's jumping with his horse into the, into the orc army, and he's like, Rah! I cry from sheer, like, 
It's the it's one of the only times I can think of where I cry from sheer wonder, and that sounds the that's the nerdiest I can sound. I recognize that, but like normally you cry like either out of happiness or sadness. Mm -hmm. I literally cry in that situation because my body doesn't know what else to do with what it just saw. That is marvelously said. Marvelously said. Um, well done. The second, uh, and now let's look. Now let's turn to Return of the King, shall we? Let's. We shall. There is a character in the Return of the in the Lord of the Rings series that becomes up in Two Towers, and who I find to be one of the most difficult characters to deal with. He is, um, and that is the King of Rohan, um, whose name is Theoden. Um, Theoden, sure, Theoden, Theoden King, and uh, um, King Theoden uh, is like he's just like the whole time he's like so like oh, I don't know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> He just so annoys me. It's like, dude, just grow a pair and be a king for the love of God, please. We already have a moody guy who doesn't want to be king with Aragorn. We don't need two of you. And he's so wishy-washy. And then finally, he, they get to the battle scene on the plains of Pelennor, and he's got his whole army of horsemen. And he stands up before them, and he says, uh, Today, we ride into battle. And then he goes, uh, um, We are likely riding to our deaths. And um, he lifts up, you know, join me, will you join me? And everybody's, and then he lifts up his sword. You're, you're, by the way. He lifts up his sword, I'm making you cry. He lifts up <sighs> his sword, and I've never seen anything like this in movies. And maybe it's just because I haven't seen enough movies, but he lifts up his sword and screams at the top of his lungs to death. Yes. And death, and everyone screams death. And it's like, what, what is going on in this world? Like, <laughs> It is, it is the most magnificent thing I've ever seen um, yeah. because men are so concerned with honor and we're so concerned with bravery. It matters so much to us because we're, it's, we're told that it should matter to us. And that is this perfect image of a guy like embracing because he does not in any way think he's going to survive. Yeah. And him, him and this character being so wishy-washy and frankly cowardly through much of it yeah. Bec like embraces bravery and the death that he knows is to, to come, and it for I mean it just is like just right to that spot. Okay, yeah. that's 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 kills me. Yeah. Um, there's two moments in the in this scene of Aragorn's when Aragorn gets crowned. Oh, but before that, in the extended edition, when they go to charge, and they think Frodo's dead, and he turns around. Aragorn turns around and looks at his boys. And he says, for Frodo. Oh my God. And then turns and starts running at this incredible army all by himself. Stop it. And, like, and who are the first people to follow him? Who are the first ones to follow him? There's two people. The, it's, it's Pip. It's Mary and Pip. It's, yeah. the, it's the Hobbits. It's Mary. Yeah. I mean, come on. It, it's it's yeah. ridiculous. It's so good. And then the other ones are like, oh, the little halflings are running. We should probably run. Indeed. It's amazing. Um, and then he gets, he, he wins, he gets crowned. At this point, if you haven't seen Lord of the Rings Return of the King, get your life together. And right. the extended edition is amazing. Oh. And, I, and people go, there's eight endings. Good. Every single one of them is amazing. So he gets crowned. I want to I I pause you real quick here because I know what you're about to say and I'm getting ready to cry. Okay. I'm getting, go. Hit well, first me. of all, I cried twice in that scene. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, so I know. So the first time I cry... Aragorn's walking around after he's been cor cor coronated? Sure. Cor coroned? No. Um, <laughs> enthroned, shall we say. Um, today, or by the coronated. way... coronated. Digre digression. Today uh, was today was the enthronement... Oh, no, yesterday, because today's Friday. Yesterday was the enthronement of the Archbishop of Canterbury, which is the head, the, the, the head bishop of the Church of England and, and the symbol symbolic head of the Anglican Communion, of which I'm a part... So there was an enthronement today. Nice. I did not cry during that, just Fair. for the record. Fair. Um, I cried during the fake one that I saw on television, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> He's walking around sort of seeing the different dignitaries, and then he makes eye contact with um, Elrond, who's like the head, one of the head elves. And his Elrond, whose daughter he's in love with. And, and there's this whole, the whole movie, the whole trilogy is this whole like, will they, won't they end up together, and you think she's gone forever. And Elrond gets this like, this cat and cat's got the canary grin on his face, and you're like, Bruh? 
And then they like move aside, and there is uh, I don't even know, I don't even know any of their names anymore. It's great, Ar- <laughs> Lady Arwen. Right, which is Liv Tyler. There's Liv Tyler, who's 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 Aragorn's love, and they look at each other, and the look on her face is like she's ne- legitimately like nervous. Yeah. I cry every time. Boom. The look on her face and the look on his face, it's like, we're done. Like, I'm done. Now, I've just recovered from this. <laughs> barely. And I mean barely. And Aragorn and, 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 now, and now Arwen is with him, and they walk over, and everyone's bowing and kneeling to them. And then they're, or no, they're done with the bowing and kneeling. They're all standing, right? And they walk up to, they walk up to the four hobbits. And the four hobbits are right at the end of this thing. I'm going to kill you right now. <laughs> And the four hobbits, and I'll never forget uh, uh, Sam Gamgee's face, right? The four hobbits uh, kneel before the king. And Aragorn looks at them like totally like aghast that they would kneel. And he says, my friends, you kneel for no one. And then the king of all humans bows down before them. And then all of them kneel before him. Before the before the hobbits, all of them, all of the people kneel at once before the four hobbits. It is ridiculous. Oh, so amazing. Oh, and and you get you get the wide shot because it starts with just them, and then you get the wide shot of the entire crowd. Uh, oh, Sam oh Hamm, God, a mess. And it's just like, what is going on? It is, uh, it is, it is amazing. I cried at least two other times in that movie, but I'll just leave that with that. Um. I cry at the end of the Winslow Boy every time. Oh. I cry during Fearless, fe- yeah. various times. The the Jeff Bridges movie. Oh. Um, yes. I cry. Uh, I cry. Like I said, but I cry. But I'm like you. I cry. Like I cried at Almost Famous last night for like. Oh God. I have to leave the room at the end of Toy Story Three, or I will become subhuman. <laughs> Toy Story Three. Ca- rushes me. Yes. 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 I no cry. I, I I cry at Wally. Um, yep. Oh, the end of Monsters Inc. Pretty much the end of every Pixar movie is. Yes. And the beginning of Up. <laughs> the beginning and the end of Up. But the right. end even more so because the three of them are all sitting there calling out the colors of the cars, and it's yes. so just like. Um, and the last lines in Monsters Inc. kill me uh, every time. Yep. Uh, so yeah. I don't think that there. I'm trying to think. Are there romantic movies that make me cry? And I don't know if that's. I don't know. Like I don't know if there's movies that I cry like when women cry. I. I cry. I don't know that I cry anymore. But for a long time, I cried at the end of When Harry Met Sally. Not okay. when they actually get together, but when he starts running through New York. Oh, Andy. Yeah. yeah. No, um, I never cried during that. I can't think of a. I can't think of a. Uh, a movie where I cried because two people got together. I'm trying to think, yeah. but I, I can't. But like last night, I cried when, and almost famous when the mom, Frances McDormand, who is so good. First of all, just period, she is so good. Yeah. But then in that movie, she is exemplary as just in everything about her is stellar. Yes. But when she looks at her daughter and sees her daughter and son and her daughter has no desire to see her but like she sees her and the look on her face I got, and she grabs her and she goes I forgive you and the daughter goes I for, either says for what or or like or like I didn't apologize or something like that but she right. still holds on to her and she's like you're home and like I just got all I got all goofy and I was like what just happened I've seen this movie a dozen times why am I crying now so yes. I'm a mess I guess is what I'm saying um. Yeah, I'm a mess. Um. Well, man, after that emotional ringer of a question about crying, uh, let's move on to um a different topic. Question number three from friend of the podcast Whitney. Hello, Hi, Whitney. Friend. First question Thanks. from Whitney ever. Uh, say again. First question. Yes. From first question from Whitney, and uh, thankfully we're. Turning to a different topic. Who is the best male crier? Oh, man. What is the best, either best acted or most moving, scene of a man crying? I'll tell you what it was. It wasn't second breakfast five minutes ago. I'll tell you that right now. (laughs) Right. Us. That's it. So, not so much the escape from the topic that I was, that that my tear ducts were hoping for. Um, 
You want to go, or you want me to go? Um, well, the answer obviously is no, none. Men shouldn't cry. Nice. nice. Um, nice. I feel like less of a man for the last answer that I did, and this one, let me just say men should never cry. If sure. you are crying in a movie, you are less of a man. It's true. Um, no, I think it's a good question. You go first. I mean, perhaps it's just because I'm exposed to him a lot right now. Mel Gibson. Oh, wow. He kills me. The scene, the scene, I mean, the scene in the first Lethal Weapon, the yes. scene, it, in many of his movies, he has occasion to cry, and he kills me every time. He just does. Mel um, Gibson is an exemplar of, um, of masculine crying. Yes, Agreed. A cry that he has he has mastered the art of seeming super masculine while crying. Yes, uh, a special a special uh, notice for the extremely manly and extremely weepy cast of Lord of the Rings. Everybody cries in that movie. In those Everybody movies. cries. Everybody cries. Gandalf. Everybody <laughs> cries. Um. I have I have a number of people I could list, but one that I just couldn't get out of my head was Jack Nicholson at the end of Five Easy Pieces. Okay, I don't remember Where it, but I believe you. He is he is trying to reconcile with his father and okay. not doing a very good job of it, and he just has a breakdown, and it just it kills me. It, it I don't me. I don't doubt that, even though I don't remember it because I saw it when I was in high school or even before. I don't remember when I saw it last, but uh, that doesn't surprise me. In, he's a, in a career filled with performances that would be so far above anyone else's best performance, it's kind of silly. I think that I think Five Easy Pieces might be his best performance. That's, it's certainly in the conversation. I need to see it again. I need to see you it do. again. It, you will. You. I you know excited my, you to see it again. He's my favorite, so it's always fun to watch Jack Nicholson do things. Indeed. Um, okay. I think Brando. I think Brando crying when Sonny dies. I see how they massacred my boy. Yep. Uh, it's so simple. Um, I think that's the thing that I, I mean, I'm trying to think, you mentioned Mel Gibson and you mentioned uh, Jack Nicholson breaking down, which is great. I think most of my examples are like much more like, like dignified, which is not cool of me. Like, uh, <laughs> no, but it's very sort of simple, like Nigel Hawthorne at the end of Winslow Boy when he's got the yes. tears coming on the side. Yes. Um, uh, uh, um, there's a couple that I had in mind. I can tell you what I think the worst scene of a man crying in the history of cinema is. I um, hope I know what it is. Please, I bet please. you know what it is. Do you want to? Do you want to guess? Um, well, if if I can guess, could I first guess what's in the box? <laughs> That's it. That's it. what's in the box. What's in the box? Ah, 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 ah. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't care what you think of this actor. If you think Brad Pitt's performance in Seven, and particularly in the last scene of Seven is good, you are objectively wrong. It is one of the worst things I have ever seen, ever. It is so terrible. And he cries like someone trying to win an Oscar. Yes. That's what he cries like, yes. and it is nonsense. And his, it, and that's the thing is, it, I actually now there are movies in which I love Brad Pitt, but it actually took me a long time because it, I had to get over that. And I remember getting in a fight with my dad about that scene. Because my dad's argument was that she, he should have won an Oscar for that scene. Ew. And I was like, you, sir. My dad had terrible taste. My dad thought the movie First Night, where Sean Connery plays King Arthur, was a good movie. Woof. Okay. I, not to speak ill of the dead, but my dad had terrible taste in films. Okay. <laughs> Um, he gave me a love of movies, but his taste in movies was not always so great. Right. Thank God um, he only took you that first step, and you took the second step on your just, own. I, I had to step out on my own eventually. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's the worst thing ever. I think um, this is kind of a joke, but I still love it. Um, Wayne, uh, uh, Mike Myers as Wayne Campbell in Wayne's World, and it even flashes the words Oscar scene on the bottom. And he's like, you think I don't mind? Well, I mind. I mind big time. And then he grabs some water and throws it on his face. Yes. <laughs> goes, and the worst part is I never learned to read. That, is that that's, true? <laughs> well, everything except the reading part. 
That that scene is amazing. Amazing. Um, yes. Um, there is a scene where, uh, well, Daniel Day Lewis is a fantastic crier. Agreed. Agreed. And he has he has a moment uh, when he watches his father die in Last of the Mohicans, which is pretty um, amazing. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, so I guess all my versions are all pretty manly. I really want to think about more about this, though, because I feel like you name some where the men break down, and I know there are some good men. Bra- oh, okay, okay. First of all, by the way, you got to love that I mentioned Godfather and crying and tied the two together from the first. Okay. Yes, well I done. actually would argue, and I'm ready to take some flack for this, but one of the high points in Godfather Part 3 is when the daughter, and I don't care about spoiling Godfather Part 3, because Godfather Part 3 spoils itself. It's true. It's um, true. Is when someone's trying to kill uh, Michael Corleone and they accidentally shoot his daughter. Yes. Now, part of it is you get to see one of the worst actresses that ever, ever be shot. That's beautiful. But on top of that, <laughs> he does this, like, he grabs onto her, and he does this, like, what you see children do which is a complete and utterly silent cry, and then he inhales and then, like, just explodes, like, howls. Yes. And, it's, and it's believable, and it made me cry. And it's like, it's, it's, like, there are moments in Godfather 3 that almost, almost make Godfather 3 worthwhile, though it isn't, but almost. And that's one of those moments. Like, you really actually believe it I, in that moment. I could not agree with... Not only do I agree with you, I agree with every discrete part of what you just said. I love when that happens. It's so rare. So that's my answer. I think so. But who's the best male crier is still a good question. Like, is there a guy who just cries often? I can't think of one who does it better than Mel Gibson. I'm serious. Kevin Spacey in Usual Suspects, when he when he breaks down his verbal kint, is uh, and because he does, yes. he's willing to go just straight up weak. Yep. That's true. That's you know, true. Which I appreciate. Mm-hmm. Um, Tom Hanks in Philadelphia. Yeah. When he's when he's narrating the opera. Tom Hanks in at at Jenny's graveside in Forrest Gump. Is Tom Hanks the best male crier? He might Tom be. Tom Hanks t- Tom Hanks made me cry with him at the at the death, wait for it of a volleyball. Just roll that around in your head. Maybe Tom Hanks is the best male crier in it Hollywood. Might be. It might be. Wow. We know it's not Brad Pitt. We know, we know it, one thing we, we know, know it sure. might be Mike Myers, but probably not. Probably not. Um, he did have a very affecting scene towards the end of The Love Guru. I, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Have you seen that movie? Of course not. Hey, listen, you never know. I remember reading, I remember seeing like he was in a new movie, it might have been Love Guru, and, and I just saw a little snippet that showed a picture of Mike Myers and it said, if we, if we tell you you're funny, will you just go away? <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, there you go. There you go. Okay. So we, we've come to at least close to an accord there. I like it. Uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go fix my face. Um, I want to stop. I want one more thing I want to say. Please. The whole last half hour of the Friday Night Lights movie. Yep. Beginning with Billy Bob Thornton's speech. Yep. About being perfect. Yep. And what it means to be perfect. If you can look at your friends with love in your hearts and know you did your best, then you can be perfect. From there forward, I, when the abusive dad gives him son his state champion ring... Just that movie. See, see, Allison, it's all football and swords. It's ridiculous. I'm sorry. I wish it was something. I wish I was less cliche, but it is football and swords. It's totally there fair. You, there it's you totally go. fair. Okay. Well, everybody, this has been another week down. of Second Breakfast Podcast and another mailbag. Thank you to Damon, Allison, and Whitney for your excellent questions. Um, Get out there and watch some college basketball this weekend, guys. Come on. Go Blue Devils. I mean, I know that if you're not me, you're probably not rooting for the Blue Devils because... Wait a minute. To be fair, they're not hated because they're not popular. There's plenty of Duke fans out there. 
That's true. That's true. Uh, Andy's a Duke fan because he graduated from Duke Law. It's true. I am a Duke fan because I lived in North Carolina, and I was told I had to choose between Chapel Hill and the Blue Devils, and everyone said that Duke were uh, snobby uh, private school elitist kids, so I clearly was going to root for them. That was awesome. like, that's they're, they're mine. So. Love it. And uh, the bar isn't set very high. If Duke gets out of the first round, we've improved on our performance in the tournament last year. So, yay? Go Blue Devils? Devils? Go Blue Devils. Uh, and um, and I'm gonna go. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off and go watch some games because they're happening right now. Go get them, Tiger. All right. We'll see you again next week, everybody. Thanks. Bye bye. Adios.